Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this webinar of the Future Classroom Lab, titled Empowering Educators Leveraging Professional Development. I am Eugenia Casariego, and I work for European Schoolnet. I am very glad to be here with you all today and to be today as your host. Before I start introducing our speakers and the webinar of today, and for those of you who do not know us yet, European Schoolnet's mission is to inspire and support the 34 member ministers of education, as well as schools, teachers like yourselves, and other relevant and education stakeholders in Europe in the transformation of education processes. We do this by identifying and testing promising innovative practices, by sharing evidence, evidence of their impact, by supporting and mainstream, the mainstreaming of teaching and learning practices aligned with the 21st century standards for inclusive education. And the Future Classroom Lab, in which this webinar is inscribed, is an initiative of European Schoolnet and an inspirational learning environment in Brussels, inviting visitors to rethink the role of pedagogy, technology, and design uh, in their classrooms. It's what we like to call a, an ecosystem more than a space. And today's webinar is organized in collaboration with Lenovo, a multinational corporation that is known for its innovation in the technology sector. Lenovo is one of the partners of the Future Classroom Lab, or FCL, as we may be referring it through today's chat. And we are happy to be joined today by an expert who will introduce us to a variety of professional development methodologies, tailored specifically for educators like yourselves to explain the benefits of each of these approaches. We will be taking a deep dive into the platform Intel Skills for Innovation, and I'm personally very excited to learn more about it. Um, and so therefore, without further ado, I would like to introduce today's speakers. So I welcome online Alexandra Cluet, working at Lenovo France in charge of professional development. And we will later hear from uh, Simon Johnson, who is a senior education consultant at Tablet Academy. Before I pass on the floor to Alexandra, I would like to remind you that after this presentation, we will have time to address any comments or questions you may have. So feel free to share your thoughts, comments, and ideas on the Q&A section that you can see on this platform. And without further delay, I would like to give the floor to to you, Alexandre, uh, and first, and then we'll move on, move on to Simon. Thank you, Eugenia. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alexandre Clouet. Welcome to this webinar uh, about empowering educators. So um, I'm uh, working at Lenovo, and I'm in charge of uh, professional development. So just before I present uh, quickly uh, the topic uh, of today's session, I just would like to say thank you to your European Schoolnet and Future Classroom for organizing and put this webinar together so we can present you a professional development. So thank you, European Schoolnet. Um, so today's topic is about professional development and show how can um, this tool can empower pro, uh, teachers for their uh, classroom and reach the best outcome for their students. So um, there's a do. Um, um, let me introduce you, uh, Simon, who is um, uh, working for Tablet Academy. Uh, Tablet Academy is an expert in uh, providing professional development as well as training and workshop for educators. And Simon, uh, our consultant, uh, who is also a partner of ours, uh, will present you today our topic, which is professional development. Simon, over to you. Thank you. So my name is Simon. I'm a former ICT and computing teacher. Uh, in England. I'm now an education consultant for a company called the Tablet Academy, uh, where we provide teacher training. So during this session, um, I'm going to share with you some um, ways that you can uh, develop your professional development, uh, look at different strategies, look at the benefits of those, and also share my experience as a teacher and how I benefited from some of these um, strategies. So uh, if you'd like to share my um, screen, please. So in this session, we're going to look at the um, different professional development um, tools available to teachers, to educators, um, look at um, the important role that professional development has um, on individuals as teachers and how that supports our students. Um, and also look at, um, in particular, independent learning and strategies you can do to uh, improve your teacher effectiveness. So we all know that professional development um, is important, not just for our careers, but also to uh, help us in the classroom and to benefit our students. But why is it so important now? 
So we're entering um, a new era called uh, Industry 4 or the Fourth Industrial Revolution. Um, and as a result of that, um, the skills and the knowledge that the students or your students are going to need in this new uh, era uh, has changed. Now, we can't predict the future. Uh, no one would have predicted or no one would have been able to predict uh, um, the COVID pandemic um, or the proliferation of uh, artificial intelligence and gen generative AI um, uh, across the world and in, in education. In the same way, we can't predict what jobs children will be doing in the future. We've got a good idea what they may look like. Uh, but what we do know is the areas that industry needs skills in now and what areas are need skills in the future. So um, areas such as Internet of Things, uh, simulation and modeling, um, autonomy and robotics and drones, um, virtual reality and mixed reality and augmented reality, uh, and also artificial intelligence and machine learning. Um, to give you a kind of idea um, of what the future will look like, this is um, the results of a survey, um, the Future Jobs Survey 2023 by the World Economic Forum. Um, and they predict that by 2027, um, there's going to be a shift um, in uh, the type of jobs that uh, our students were doing when they leave school. So you're going to see a decline in traditional jobs like cashiers, postal workers, data entry clerks, uh, uh, legislators and um, bookkeepers. But what you're going to see is a shift um, in new jobs so things like uh, red it security cyber security um, robotics engineering data science uh, and analytics and you're starting to see that trend already um, for those of you who like football uh, i recently read a report about how when liverpool football club uh, won the premier league a few seasons ago um, they employed mathematicians, statisticians, and used artificial intelligence to help them uh, make decisions both on the pitch and off the pitch. So AI and technology are already here. So how do you how do you support those students to develop those skills? Skills like analytical thinking, curiosity, um, uh, technical uh, te uh, technical literacy, uh, leadership skills, um, uh, and flexibility and resilience. Um, not only that, a report, or the same report by the World Economic Forum, suggests that 65% of the children entering primary school uh, education, um, when they leave um, college or university, um, they'll be doing jobs that don't even exist yet, that not even been invented. Jobs like drone traffic optimizer, self-driving car mechanic, uh, augmented reality journey builder, uh, working around AR and VR, uh, and makeshift structure engineers. Um, if you wanna know what a makeshift structure engineer is, think about 3D printing, but instead of tiny models, 3D printing on a massive scale. So 3D printing schools, houses, and even buildings and infrastructure on Mars and the moon. So how do we prepare jobs for those, or our students for those jobs that don't even exist yet? Um, part of the way that we do that is through our professional de development. So I'm going to look through some support mechanisms that are available to you as an educator, um, and then look at some of these in more detail and look at the benefits of some of these and ways that you can get the most of these different um, mechanics and these different tools. So we're going to look at, in this uh, session, things like skills reviews and how they can be used to identify uh, staff's individual needs. Um, we look at um, tools that can assist with your CPD, like online platforms. And uh, we mentioned the Intel SFI, Skills for Innovation platform, which we'll mention a little bit more uh, later in this webinar. We look at peer coaching and mentoring, how staff can work collaboratively and support each other to help uh, with their career. Uh, we look at professional learning communities uh, or professional learning networks, PLCs or PLNs, how you can use social media like X and Facebook and other online platforms to support your professional development. We'll also look at digital champions, um, both teachers 
and student digital champions and how they can help support the use of technology in school and drive the use of technology. And we'll also finish by looking at independent learning and we'll focus on the SFI platform by Intel in partnership with Innova. So how do you start? How do you know what um, your educators, what your teachers, what you need? So we often start off with a skills review. So uh, skills review uh, is an, a, a skills assessment. It's a tool that uh, identifies um, needs and areas for growth in staff. Um, it usually starts off with an online survey with staff filling. Um, then the results are collated. Um, and from those results, you're able to identify individual staff needs, but also identify patterns for all the staff in your school or establishment. And from that, you can then develop a uh, digital skills plan to address staff needs. Um, professional development can take several forms, uh, and we're going to explore some of those in a moment. So how, once you've that list of staff needs, um, how do you address those? What can we use? Probably the most commonly used uh, strategy for professional, professional development that we all um, are used to are staff training days. So staff training days tend to happen uh, whole school, so all staff are involved. Um, there's usually a focus on teaching and learning um, or on on policy or uh, school strategy uh, or pedagogical approach uh, and it's usually held once or twice or three times a year usually the first day after school holidays benefits of these training days are um, it can foster uh, collaboration uh, and teamwork so it encourages teamwork and collaboration among staff it also allows for staff to share ideas and best practice um, it involves a whole school, so everyone's all on the same page, um, and it's great for introducing school policy, strategies, and procedures. Um, it could be more cost effective for schools um, by having all the staff in one place at one time. Um, it can also use to support um, whole school wide changes. So, by adopting the uh, whole school approach, it's easy to implement new initiatives and facilitate changes more effectively. Um, it's great for um, building um, opportunities for networking with different staff and different colleagues. Um, one thing I liked about um, staff training days, whole school training days, is sometimes you can feel isolated in your uh, in your classroom or in your department. So it's great to actually meet with other colleagues within, within the school uh, and share best practice. And whole school days, training days allow for that. Uh, and it can also improve morale and, and motivation. However, I also find there are some drawbacks or downsides to whole staff, staff training days. Um, one of the challenges is the fact that um, schools are all, always facing evolving challenges that change day to day. And one of the problems with um, in-service or, or, or whole staff training is that uh, it can't address ongoing issues. So you can't, if there's a problem with school, you can't wait until two months down the line to do a training day about it, it's too late. Uh, so it's difficult to address real-time challenges. Um, it can also have limited sustained impact. Um, teachers might forget what they did last week because it's six months along the line, um, or they don't have an opportunity to keep on practicing. One thing I remember as a teacher is that um, when I was delivering certain topics, if I wasn't delivering a topic regularly or using a tool regularly i had to keep on reminding myself how to use it because i'm not using it uh, day to day um, also it doesn't give you opportunity to explore things in depth you usually have a day a half day um, to explore um, so many topics so you can't explore them in the depth that you would like to um, and um, it could also become stagnant um, because you might have a training day, really excitement, really exciting. Everyone's really excited to start the new school year. And then six months down the line, they forgot about it uh, or haven't had a chance to uh, put that into practice. So what are some of the uh, other strategies? One of my favorite um, strategies to support 
professional development is this idea of digital champions. So digital champions are um, teachers that um, are um, experts in the field and they could be adept at using um, digital technologies. Uh, and they try new technologies, try new strategies within that classroom. And then they either mentor another member of staff, support that mem men mentor um, support the, um, member of staff, or uh, as a mentor, or they will then um, run uh, mini after school training sessions um, or do a kind of show and tell um, to other colleagues and other members of staff uh, how they're using technologies or how they are adopting these new strategies. But something that's often overlooked is um, what we call student digital champions. So student digital champions or student leaders uh, have a similar role to um, teachers uh, or um, staff digital champions, um, but they can help to support the school's vision, school's use of technology, because uh, they're the, the end user at the end of the day. Uh, so student leaders are student, uh, uh, students that are adept at using technology and willing to share their knowledge with others. Um, the role they can play is support staff and students with the use of technology, promote e-safety, uh, test new equipment and resources, share their knowledge and skills with others, and help shape the use of technology in the school. To give you an example, I remember um, I had some staff training on the use of OneNote, Microsoft OneNote. And I thought, oh, this is fantastic. So my next lesson, I created this OneNote. Um, and the idea was um, we had a lesson on oceans um, and uh, seas. So I found a map of the world. Um, I'd removed all the major oceans and seas and then created little tabs that they could drag and drop. And I shared that with the whole class. And my idea was that the students could then work as a whole class and then drag and drop the, um, the seas and the oceans in the correct location. It was an absolute disaster. <laughs> uh, nothing uh, wrong with the technology. Technology is fine. It's just the way that I implemented it. Students were crying because they'd lost their work. Uh, people say, oh, um, so, um, my machine's been hacked. Someone's deleted my work. Um, and it was a total mess. If I had a digital leader program at that time, I could have um, used those students after school in a club or a class to test that technology out or te test my new theory or new idea out before I actually use it in a lesson. Um, I also used to uh, run a Minecraft club with digital leaders. Um, and one day, um, the uh, history teacher came to Minecraft club and said, I've heard we've got Minecraft in school. I'd like to use Minecraft in my lessons, but I haven't got time to learn how to use it. And I don't know where to start. Um, so the digital leaders, these students turned to the teacher and said, well, we can help you with that. What would you like to do? So the teacher said, I want to explore medieval Britain, uh, but I often find it's difficult for students to look at a picture and understand what it's like to walk down the narrow streets and the dirty streets in medieval Britain. So we'll, we'll create that. So the students started to create the world. The teacher came back as a client, um, helped with um, decision-making around the world build. And then once the uh, world had been built, this, some of the students went and supported the first lesson of the teachers. So the teacher was comfortable using the technology. And then the teacher was able to then use Minecraft in the in, uh, other lessons. And, the, and then two weeks later, English teacher came to Minecraft Club. Can you help me? So um, digital leaders uh, um, are really useful in supporting you with the use of technology and with your professional development. In fact, um, one of my favorite quotes is, never be afraid to let your students teach you. Um, one of the problems with teaching is that we often assume that we have to be the font of all knowledge and we have to be able to answer all the questions. One, it's unhealthy to know everything. Uh, and we can never know everything. But sometimes there will be times when your students will know something more about a topic than you do. Minecraft is a classic, classic example. I actually learnt about Minecraft with my students who went on the journey together. So it's good to learn from your students, but also learn with them as well. It also makes you look human and makes you more relatable to your students as well. Um, another one of my favorite areas for professional development is uh, professional learning networks. So PLNs or PLCs, professional learning communities, are often 
um, online communities where teachers, educators can share best practice. Um, best places to build these PLNs are places like uh, X, formerly Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn's great as well for finding, um, linking up with other educators and sharing best practice. And then once you've joined those communities, I recommend that you ask questions, ask for advice, participate in chats and discussions, uh, attend live webinars um, and stay connected. So some ways you can um, grow your professional learning network are through, um, this is quite old now, but um, it's still quite relevant. So things like Pinterest boards, Facebook groups, um, especially Facebook education groups are really, really useful. Um, Coffee EDU, um, some, on some um, um, groups, um, they will set up a physical meet where you can go to a local coffee shop, um, grab a coffee and just have an ad hoc conversation about the latest ed, uh, ed tech trends or the latest uh, education trends. Great for meeting up with uh, like-minded people and great for sharing best practice. Um, Twitter, now X, is another great place. Uh, uh, and there's lots and lots more. So. One of my favorite platforms um, for, for expanding my PLN is uh, X, formerly Twitter. I mean, when I first started teaching, um, my teaching practice, if it wasn't for uh, X or Twitter as it was then, um, I think I would have really struggled with my teaching practice. It was actually on X where I found about digital leaders uh, and also about how to use Minecraft um, in the classroom. Top tips, take part in education chats. There's educational chats going on um, 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 weekly. Um, if you're in primary education, primary rocks is a good one. There's also ed tech chat if you like to know about the latest um, technology in the classroom. And ed chat is a, a classic um, um, generic education chat talking everything about education. Uh, here you can also find about different topics. You can also find other people uh, on there that might be in, the, um, in, in a similar job role, um, um, teach a similar subject. Uh, also an X, if you find other teachers, uh, they often have lists, uh, lists of other people to follow. Check out those lists and, um, and, and reach out to the people on this. And also use hashtags. So uh, uh, popular ones include digital citizenship, ed tech, uh, flip classroom, which is all about flipping the classroom and um, using online tools. So X is a great place to uh, start. Uh, another uh, rich um, environment for professional development is Facebook groups. Now, I remember the first time someone said to me, uh, have you ever tried using Facebook for um, professional development? And I just looked at them and laughed. I just saw Facebook as this tool for um, uh, keep keeping in touch with our uh, um, friends and watching gifs of of, um, of kittens um, and epic fails. But actually, um, the the Facebook groups on Facebook can be really really powerful. So I'm a member of about thirty or forty groups, um, particularly computing groups. That was my my subject, and I learned so much um, and shared. I even shared some of the things I was doing in my classroom. Um, and because with computing, especially as it's a new subject, I didn't know if I was doing the right thing. And it was great to be able to share, this is what I'm doing this week. Um, and then for someone else to turn around and say, oh, that's a really good idea. I'll try that in my classroom. Or that's a good idea, but have you tried this? Um, so again, Facebook like X is a great place to find uh, other educators, whether it's in um, your subject area or education in general, to share best practice and also to confirm whether you're doing the right thing in your classroom. So through PLNs, uh, PLNs, you can uh, find mentorship, gain new teaching strategies, stay updated on educational trends, um, and also broaden your horizons. But don't just take my word for it. These are some quotes um, from some friends that I've met uh, through um, social media. So uh, Julie Shea says, my PLN keeps me grounded, learning, challenged, supported, and stretches my thinking that I don't get from my peers. Um, Dominic Kennelly says, my PLN have helped me massively in understanding new topics, adapt to curriculum changes, and has given me confidence to deliver. Um, being a connected educator gives me uh, exposure to new ideas to use with students that you would never have thought of on your own. And finally, B 
being connected has enlivened my teaching through shared ideas and led me to great practitioners, some of whom are now friends. And that was Angela Goodman. And PLNs using tools like social media tools like X um, and um, and Facebook are just one example of how you can take control of your own personal development or professional development. And it's a kind of um, type of independent learning. So when we talk about independent learning in the context of teacher professional development, first to you as a teacher taking respons responsibility for your own learning, seeking net resources, actively engaging in self-directed learning um, to help enhance your teaching practice and also your knowledge and experience. So examples of independent learning, um, as well as the ones we've already talked about, include self-study. So um, using online courses, uh, independent reading, um, IPD or independent professional development. So where you select your learning paths and this could be attending an, a workshop that you've uh, found online, you uh, join in person. Webinars are great. Uh, conferences. I remember going to a conference um, on a Saturday, a computing conference, thinking I'll be the only one there. And there's like 200 people who gave up their Saturday to learn about uh, or to improve their computing knowledge and, and to support their students. Uh, peer observations are a great one, and I'll talk about that in a, a little more detail in a moment. Um, they are great, and it kind of can open your eyes up to new uh, practices, and also reflective practice, so keeping journals or blogs. In fact, actually, um, when I first started teaching, I, I created my own blog um, about how I was um, teaching computing. Um, I think it's, at first, it is kind of a, it's a reflective tool just to uh, remind me um, of what I'm doing and just to share best practice. But what was great was then when I started to get responses back from other educators saying, oh, that's a really good idea. Or they'd taken my lesson and they'd changed it and adapted it. Have you seen this? And I'd take it back and I'd then adapt my lesson as well. So blogs are great and, and they're easy to set up now because these tools like Wix and Weebly, it's so easy to create a blog and, and start to engage with um, your peers. Um, but one of my favorite and the easiest and most accessible PD um, in your um, school is uh, working with a colleague. Um, so things like peer observation. So uh, we do this as part of our teacher training because um, we're kind of expected to, and then we kind of forget about it. And we don't do it again. Uh, it's just a shame because um, I remember um, I had once observed a PE lesson and an art lesson. Um, and as a computing teacher, I first thought, well, how is that going to benefit me? What am I going to learn? I learned so much about classroom management in the first 10 minutes of the art lesson and the PE lesson that I've ever learned anywhere else. Because unless you're an art teacher or a PE teacher, you imagine as a PE teacher having to stop 30 kids playing football. It's bad enough if you've got a, a classroom of kids playing Minecraft. Okay, I want you to stop what you're doing. Lids down, look this way. Imagine you've got kids playing football or networking. You've got to stop them all having fun. So look this way, listen to me. Um, another classic example, I was observing an art lesson. Um, and you try to uh, end an art lesson where students have to get up at their uh, the desk, walk across the, the classroom, 30 kids with uh, pots, paint pots with painting and watering. Um, if you think about it, it's this potential for disaster, but art teachers deal with this every single day. Uh, and you can learn some really great strategies around classroom management from art teachers and PE teachers. So there's a, a free tip for you. Um, another thing you can do is team teach. Um, so um, you can do this with a colleague in your own department. So you can plan a lesson together and teach it together. So you can bounce ideas off each other and share ideas. That works really well. But I sometimes find it's better if you work with someone outside of your comfort zone, outside of your classroom. Um, classic example is um, um, when I was teaching, we used to teach project-based learning. Um, we're not going to talk about project-based learning too much in this um, exercise, but uh, or this webinar, but it's, it's worth researching. But um, at my school my, uh, decided to uh, pair up teachers to deliver PBL from different departments so 
uh, I might be paired up with an art teacher or um, a graphic design teacher or music teacher. And what that did was when we're delivering the lessons, we'd both work off our strengths um, and we'd start to bounce off our ideas of each other. And you start to pick up ideas and strategies from other teachers, from other disciplines, other subjects that you probably never thought of using in your classroom. Um, but then also you think, wow, why haven't I done that before? And it's because normally you're stuck in your own classroom, in your own department where nothing changes. So it's great to get out there and actually either view a, a lesson from another teacher for another subject or actually plan a lesson with a teacher for another subject. So benefits of independent learning. So um, when you engage in independent learning, there's a deeper understanding of the subject matter, um, increased motivation and confidence. So it empowers teachers to take ownership of their personal growth and professional growth. Uh, great awareness of strengths and improvements. So through independent learning, you can uh, be more aware of your strengths and areas you need to improve on. Um, different instruction, so um, it allows you to explore different teaching strategies, different technologies, different assessment uh, methods, and uh, thus allowing you to uh, personalize the learning and make it more personalized for your students as well. Um, and it allows you to engage uh, where, and discover different approaches, just like the example where I learned how to uh, manage my classroom from watching a PE lesson. So another way to learn independently is using online tools. And one of them, as we mentioned at the start, is something called the Skills for Innovation Initiative. So um, Lenovo, working with Intel, have put together um, some resources. And I'll share the link uh, in a moment where you can get access to these. Um, but uh, Intel have put together um, a pack uh, that is designed to help teachers um, prepare themselves and their students for this fourth industrial revolution. So including the pack are lessons uh, all around the technology that I mentioned before, AR, VR, in, uh, and um, um, uh, artificial intelligence, but also there's a whole professional de development platform as well. So there are 80 hours of e-learning and in-person workshops with videos, um, case studies, uh, all designed to keep you up to date with the latest um, learning theories, the latest technologies. There's also certification and badges. So the certification and um, badges for different levels for all the different courses. Um, and you can access that by going to skillsforinnovation.intel.com and you uh, reg register with the unique code Lenovo SFI demo. It is case sensitive. Um, um, I'm sure someone um, in the studio can post this into the chat. So it's skillsforinnovation.intel.com and it's Lenovo SFI demo. So what does this actually look like in the classroom? So imagine you've uh, you've gone um, uh, uh, signed up for the online course, you've completed some of the um, online PD. What does that actually look like in the classroom? So. One of the uh, examples in the SFI program is um, exploring something called um, uh, experimental or inquiry-based learning. So this is where students, rather than replicating um, e uh, examples or lab experiments from textbooks, they actually research, design their research and design their own experiments. And it allows them to uh, understand the world around them much better. But it also um, provides them opportunity to fail. Um, one problem I find with, um, with the whole education system is because at the end of the day, students are assessed on where, how well they do, their exams, their grades. Um, there's little opportunity in there for them to fail. But failure is an important part of life. Um, and learning to um, learning from those, those failures, learning from the experience is really, really important life lesson. Uh, so how do you get them to fail and learn from those failures? 
And one of those strategies is inquiry-based learning. So what does it look like in the classroom? The teachers developing the guided inquiry model based on the curriculum, but then the students are shaping where they want to go with it. We're going to go through our lab sheet quickly, and then we're going to get into our experimental group. They were told that two scientists had a mix-up in their lab, they had some seeds, they had some eggs, and now they don't know which are which. And students had the opportunity to decide what they thought would be helpful for the experiments for us. Helpful experiments for us to get our hands instead of opening with a bunch of information and facts and detail. The students are given a problem, and then they're the ones who get to drive the I'm trying to see which ones are eggs and which ones are seeds, but we don't. So we're trying to figure out chat and teach that you can make or snacks, and that's the only thing that we can do. And if they're planting them and we think the seeds will grow and the eggs won't. I think they'll get bigger. Yeah, so once they get bigger, it would like crack open. And then... Teachers are guiding with questions to really get students thinking and learning how to question themselves. How might that help us figure out which are the eggs and which are the seeds? Loading or sinking? I might think the eggs are heavier than the seeds. I like doing it this way because you get to touch what you're actually doing instead of just looking at it. We started with the inquiry model in science, and as we started to see students getting excited about finding answers to deeper level questions, we saw the power and how that could be implemented throughout the school day. The teachers. Hopefully that gives you um, an idea of um, what this looks like in the classroom. So you'll find um, online and through the uh, SFI um, courses, um, case studies and examples of what um, this looks like in your classroom. Uh, one thing I love about the inquiry-based learning model is that uh, in the video, I hope you'll be able to hear the same, but if you, if you weren't, um, the students were given this scenario. Um, so rather than saying, this is what an egg is, this is what a seed is, they had to, uh, they were given this scenario that uh, the scientists had forgotten what an egg and what a seed was. So they had to design their own experiments in order for the scientists to be able to run the experiment and tell which was an egg and which was a seed. So they had to come up with their own hypotheses on what would work. Uh, so one group thought that, well, um, if you were to plant an egg and a seed in the ground, um, the seed would grow and the egg wouldn't, and that would tell the scientists which was the seed and the egg. Um, um, then another group of students thought, well, let's look at the egg and look at the seed. The seed looks bigger and heavier, and the, the seed looks very light. So they assumed that the egg would sink um, if they put it in water, and the seed would float, which in most cases would be correct, unless the egg was bad, in which case it would float. So they would try these experiments out, and if they were correct, and they could kick them off. If it, if it didn't work, then it, um, the inquiry-based model is designed on a um, strategy that's used in industry called killer experiments. Uh, and the idea is that uh, before you spend lots of money um, on an experiment or on a project, you, you do a prototype first. If it fails, you just completely disregard it. The same with experiments. They might try an experiment think, I think this will work. And if it doesn't, they just strike it off and then move on to the next one. And it helps them to deal with failure, but then learn from that failure um, and move on. So hopefully that has given you um, some ideas about um, how you could um, explore um, different um, ways to improve your CPD. So think about um, using expanding your professional learning network, your professional learning community, using social media tools like X and Facebook to find people um, and to share best practice. Um, thinking about the idea of peer coaching. So you might want to become a coach yourself um, and coach others um, or find coaches uh, or um, colleagues in your school um, where you can work together and share best practice and share ideas. Uh, or it might be that you might want to set up your own digital leader program um, where you have students supporting, um, not only um, uh, supporting and driving the use of technology in the classroom, but also 
being in the classroom and having that um, confidence that uh, when you try new technology out or try a new strategy, you've got some students in your classroom that have done this before, know what they're doing, and they can be there to help and support you and boost your confidence trying these new techniques out. Um, and also, hopefully, you might go away from this and sign up for the um, uh, SFI platform as well. Try out some of the lessons and also try out some of the professional development tools as well. So hopefully that's giving you a lot to think about. Um, and um, this now an opportunity to uh, ask some questions. Thank you very much, Simon, for this very insightful presentation of different pathways of professional development. I've certainly taken a lot of insights into it and, and got some very new, uh, very new good ideas. Uh, we have a question from the audience regarding the professional learning networks, which I part found particularly interesting as well, because at European Schoolnet, one thing we do with our online courses is these study groups, which are basically professional learning networks. And we see that it has a tremendous impact on teachers' learning, and as well, it drives up completion rates as well as engagement rate with the courses. So someone else is also very intrigued on these professional learning networks. And Philip Rimas is asking us, in your experience, are these PLN more effective in international contexts or perhaps more in closer and smaller groups? So um, both. Uh, so some of those quotes I gave you, Julie Shea, uh, I'm based in the UK, so I'm based in England. Um, and Julie Shea is a teacher educator um, in, a, in the US. Um, and uh, we found that we both um, had similar ideas that we we're delivering um, the different sides of the globe. Um, so a lot of the things you pick up, even though um, so one of the things that um, I picked up um, was uh, PBL. So PBL is something um, that's been delivered quite a lot in the US and they've been quite successful and it was only starting to make its way um, into the UK. Um, so it was great to speak to teachers from um, the US um, and uh, other parts of the world that have been delivering this uh, strategy and kind of um, got to know what works and what doesn't work so I can then uh, implement that in my classroom. Um, but then there's things that we were doing so the computing curriculum so I was starting to teach computing and sharing what I was doing and then I met some colleagues in Australia who were about two or three years behind so just starting to implement the computing curriculum and then I was be able to share my ideas with them and they were able to come oh that's great but have you tried this so it, it's just one it's so it's not not just localized it is international uh, great for sharing best practice and it's also nice to get kind of a nod to say actually what you're doing in your classroom is the right thing because sometimes you just sit you, inside your classroom you don't speak to anyone else and you kind of think well, am i doing the right thing am i doing the right thing for my students and sometimes by sharing with through blogs or through um plns someone will come back and say i really like that idea and or i'm doing the same thing which kind of helps you think well actually i must be doing something right Indeed, and I can also mind that it gives some context as well to these new developments and as well as skill develop needs for skill development, because when you hear peers from other countries that are going, as you mentioned right now, in the same direction that perhaps you are going, I, I can mind that being motivating as well as as well as give you some idea or direction as well. So definitely. Um, another approach that I personally found very interesting was when you mentioned the student digital champions, as, as indeed I, I cannot agree more with you that there is so much to learn from students, especially when it comes to technology and new applications. I mean, often they know much more than we do. So, but I was wondering how in practice this works at the school and how can we motivate other colleagues at incorporating these student leaders, colleagues that may be a bit reticent towards giving students this role? What What is your advice here? So um, when I first started um, launching my digital leader program, we, we started by uh, advertising. So the students had to uh, complete uh, job applications if they were like in the world of work and to tell us why um, they thought they should be a digital leader. And we went through the application. We, we actually um, we had the head of our school to do the uh, interviews as well. So it, it seemed even more um, real and then um, as part of the program, we started to explore some of the new technologies we had in school. So uh, look at laptops. Um, digital leaders are great if you're going to one-to-one -one school because they, because the students are the end users, they're the clients. So when you're making decisions about 
what technology to use in the classroom, uh, they can help you decide what um, their peers are going to accept or what they're going to like, um, but also um, they can um, test the, the different um, tools and resources out for you. But not only that, once they've done that, they can then support. So we'd have uh, digital badges on the students so that the teachers would know who the digital digitalists were. So if they were had a lesson, so if you had a lesson and you were doing OneNote, for example, or Minecraft, you could look around a classroom. And if you've got a child with a digital leader badge, you've got that confidence that you've got someone who can support you and support the rest of the students in that class. Right. I also like the idea of giving them that token as a sign of responsibility as well. And as a sign of, well, you mentioned the word confident. I think it's a perfect word for that as well. And kind of giving them a specific role and, and allowing them to take certain responsibility as well for their own learning and their peers learning as well, which I find extremely powerful as well. Yeah. Talking more of teaching approaches. So we have a comment by Irena who's commenting that it's important that inquiry based learning is just one approach to education. But she comments as well that uh, or ask rather, should it also be balanced with other teaching methods to ensure a well rounded education? What's your thoughts on that? Simon? Yes. Yes, I totally agree. Um, uh, so the reason why I demonstrated that was because it, had, it was a nice case study um, and you could see how the students react. Um, and as I mentioned before, but the SFI platform, that's just one example of one strategy that you can use um, um, to support your teaching. And I agree, there's no one size fits all. That's just one strategy. Uh, and as a teacher, um, the idea is that you develop and use the different strategies. So inquiry based is one project based learning is another one. Um, the thing I like about project based learning is it's more like the real world. So you have um, students working collaboratively, working as a team, working to a brief, just like they would do in, um, in business, um, managing their own time, um, setting deadlines, things like that. So uh, there's lots of different strategies. So I agree, um, it's not the only, there's not one size fits all, but the whole idea of the professional development is, and, and PLNs is finding these new strategies and, and using those to personalize um, the learning experience for your students. Indeed, and allowing the students to develop a wide set of skills as with inquiry based learning, they may develop critical thinking, but as well, how to give feedback, learning to learn, but maybe other more traditional methods also have their benefits and, and the capacity to allow students to develop other sets of skills. Indeed, yeah. I have a question more directed perhaps to Alexandra, uh, although Simon, feel free to reply if you're also aware, but Nair is asking us, um, um, how does the Intel Skills for Innovation platform that we've reviewed uh, integrate with national training programs? If it does. Do you want me to go, Simon, or? Yeah, if, if you want. Um... So I'll, I'll try to, to answer this. Um, it really adapt to the level as well of the of the program and the, the class you're having. So for example, you're having a class in, um, in um, science, depending of the subject you want to, to, uh, to propose to the students, it will adapt. Uh, of course, there's not the whole panel, but depending on the subject you want to talk about. For So for example, when I was in, the, in high school a long time ago, we were learning about the, the, uh, the earthquake and how the ground is made uh, on the earth. And you have some models like this where you can, uh, it's already made programs and presentation where you can present it to the students and how to use the technology to uh, really show how it works. So um, it really depends on this topic and how you want it to be presented. Of course, the presentation that are really made can be um, a change in how you want it to be done. So it's really, um, um, you can take some of the part as well of the modules that is presented and use it for another lesson. So it's really modable uh, and you can do it as you wish. I hope this answered the question, but Simon, feel free to answer more if, if it's good. Perfect. Yes, now you have mentioned it then. Yeah, talking a bit more about the platform, I also had another question that perhaps either you or, or Simon can answer, but what are some key topics that you find that people are finding more interesting within the platform or some key um, skills or areas that you see that there drives up a lot of interest from teachers who are signing up to the platform? I'm, I'm curious as well to, to hear more about the trends or where we are going uh, now and, and where the platform is pointing towards. I, I can answer that. So um, obviously, for some strange reason, the most popular topic seems to be artificial intelligence. <laughs> I don't know why, 
but it's no surprise um, there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the rest, the, um, the nice thing about the lessons, it doesn't just talk about what is AI. It, it allows the students to actually explore and create their own AI applications. Uh, one of my favorite lessons is um, one called Are You Happy? which explores sentiment analysis. So the idea that a computer can tell from your voice or what you type, whether you're being positive or negative or being nice or mean. So the students actually train uh, using machine learning and AI bots to understand kind words and mean words. And then they program a robot in Scratch that reacts to what you say to them. Um, um, some of the other popular ones as well as AI are um, virtual reality. So using a tool called CoSpaces, students can create their own virtual worlds uh, and, and think about um, and the challenges uh, and the design processes in creating you know, worlds for like Oculus or for the you know, VR headsets. Um, and uh, another popular one is Tinkercad. So looking at 3D um, models and 3D modeling and, and 3D design, but all the lessons also provide a real world context. Um, so to explain how this would be used in the real world. So for example, the 3D printing, it also looks at how you can use 3D printing, not just for printing key rings of Baby Yoda, but also actually use it for purposeful things like 3D repairs, so repairing things that are broken rather than you know throwaway society. So you could repair a chair leg or you could repair um, um, a toy or something at home, um, but also thinking bigger about you know using 3D printing to 3D houses, um, and 3D print schools. There's a, there's a great video about um, uh, a, a girl that set up her own NGO when she was 16, um, 3D printing schools in Madagascar, um, and then taking to the next level, looking at you know when we finally you know embark on our trip to Mars and the Moon using 3D printing technology to print um, habitats on the Moon and Mars using robots. And also, you know, how we code those robots and there's lessons around that as well. So everything's linked into the real world context to provide relevance to the students. Yeah, which I find fascinating because then it, it becomes that we don't use technology for the sake of using technology, but we also use it so that, as you said, uh, students can find the connection with real life problems and, and so on. So that's incredibly powerful. And I think it's what really we're seeing that is making now changes in pedagogy that we are no longer using technology because it's an interesting thing, flashy thing mm -hmm. to use, but we're using it because it makes sense pedagogically. It makes sense. It supports effective pedagogy and effective teaching indeed. So that's just really interesting. And indeed, no surprises that AI, machine learning, and so on is becoming increasingly popular there. Indeed, indeed. Um, before we close the webinar, though, Alexandra, Simon, would you have any remarks or last words that you would like to share with our audience on the topic of professional development or perhaps any last comments on the on the Skills for Innovation platform? I can go first, uh, Simon. So first, I would like to thank you all for joining. I hope um, the topic today was uh, valuable for you that you, you get really interested. Um, I would like to add that I will add a survey in the chatbot so you can um, fill up to so we can have some feedback about how was the presentation and you have uh, any comments. And if you have any question more about skill for innovation or PD uh, professional development, don't hesitate. There will be my email in the survey. You can reach out to me directly and we'll be more than happy to to answer you. And again, thank you for European School Net to uh, organize this webinar. And thank you, Simon, for uh, presenting uh, today professional development. Thank you, Alexandra. And the floor to you, Simon, if you would like to make any last comments. Um, just apologies for the echo with the audio. Um, that was my oh, fault. Uh, um, um, but um, also thank you to European School Net for um, making this possible. I hope you found it useful. And just remember, don't be afraid to learn from your students. Sorry, <laughs> I'm apologies because I'm at the office still and they're about to close me in. Um, so thank you both Simon and Alexandra for joining us today and for these very insightful presentations, for giving us so many new ideas on how we can continue furthering our, prof our professional skills as educators. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone for joining in today, for listening. Thank you as well for your questions uh, as well. So the, the recording of the webinar will soon be available in YouTube. So for those of you 
that would like to catch up in any of the information that we have shared or would like to um, share this information with someone that couldn't be live today with us, um, then please head to YouTube and check out the recording. Um, before we close, I would also like to say that there's there will be one other uh, webinar of the Future Classroom Lab taking place on the 12th of June entitled The Biochemistry of Learning with our partner Smart Technologies. I will copy now the link to register on the chat in case you're interested. It's taking place on the 12th of June as well as 5 p.m. And that's it for today. So once again, thank you very much, Simon, Alexandre. Thank you, everyone, for connecting. And follow us on social media for similar related opportunities and for more news in the Future Classroom Lab. Have a very good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.